Okay, just like we did the uh, the macro coronavirus uh, update review from the College Board, we're going to do one, do one for micro real quick. Um, so as you know, or you should know, your micro exam is on May 20th. Um, for us in New York, we're taking it at 4 p.m. And so here's a little quick little overview of the format of the tests. Um, so we know on the exam day, you get your e-ticket 30 minutes before the start of the exam, fill, fill out your information, have that all taken care of so you don't have to worry about that, you know, as the exam begins. Um, once the exam starts, that first question appears automatically. Um, another timer is going to start counting down that first exam question. Your timer is going to show 30 minutes. They say take 25 minutes to read the question. Um, work out your responses on your scrap paper. You know the importance of having that scrap paper handy. And then you'll have five minutes to submit your question. So like I said, 25 minutes kind of like your reading time on this exam instead of like the store 10 minutes uh, on the on normal tests. Um, you'll submit your response. You have five minutes to submit your responses. Um, and then the second exam question is going to pop up. You can't go back to the first question's response, so make sure you get it right the first time. All right? Um, second question pops up. Um, you take 15 minutes to read the question, you work on your response, and then you have your five minutes to submit it, work everything out on your scrap paper, any calculations you have to work out, if you have to draw your perfectly competitive, you know, market and the firm side by side, or your, you know, labor market, or a monopsony, or a monopoly, or if you got to draw a game theory matrix, you know, you're taking care of all of that on your scrap paper, and then you'll put your explanations into uh, the answer. Uh, sheet online. All right, so required, you have your email, uh, your e-ticket email, go through this exam day checklist before all of your AP tests just to take care of that. Um, and of course, like I said on the last video for macro, um, you need, need to make sure your technology is working that day, that afternoon, that morning. Very important, but also what's really important is to have you know some handy paper, scrap paper. Now, of course, you're allowed to use your class notes, study guides, or, you know, I, I, I said there are cheat sheets that you can make for yourself. It's an open note type test. I would try to, you know, keep it all into just a few pieces of paper. Ideally, just know exactly where everything is because you do not have all the time to go searching for the answer. You can't open up your 600-page textbook, you know, and just find the answer immediately, perhaps. But you are allowed to use your textbook, so do what works for you. Um, calculators, you can use calculators this year. Uh, that's a new thing, and like I, I joked, but I was pretty serious, I guess, on the macro video. No, uh, I've, I have students every year, they can't add, subtract, multiply, or divide. And they always want to use the calculator. This is your year. Congratulations. Cool. All right, so you're going to have two questions. Uh, the first question is going to pop up. That's like two short free response questions into one question. This is 55% of the micro exam. Um, so it's going to be based on units one through five. Uh, so you shouldn't see much with role of the government uh, and, you know, uh, market failure type stuff here. Um, they say question one is equivalent to a combination of FRQ2 and FRQ3, the shorter free response questions on the exam. So that's 55% of the test. Um, that's the 25 minute question. And then your 15-minute question is similar to a long free response question. Historically, that's FRQ number one. So if you go back, I would go back and do the last five years. Do Go back, do at least the last five years of the complete free responses of the micro exam and the macro one if you're taking the macro test. I have my students do that every year. You know, it's an awesome way to uh, do a great job on these exams. All right, so click in here, boom, sample questions for the 2020 exam, just so you have an idea of the format. So for the sample questions that the College Board put out for AP Micro, um, they're, they're drawing on the 2015 and 2007 uh, micro exam questions. So I'm not going to give you all of the answers right now. Uh, this is uh, You can look at these keys for yourself on the College Board website if you go to the 2015-2007 exam. In fact, I'm going to assign uh, these practice questions to my students. So, like, for example, this 
I believe this was the 15 question. Uh, I, we did this in class um, earlier in the year, probably a couple months ago, uh, maybe back in February when we started micro. So this is just a simple supply and demand graph for widgets. There's a lot of basic supply and demand. They say the government is considering intervening in this market. So let's see what they want to do. Basic supply and demand analysis, nice and simple. You know, you see your equilibrium price, your equilibrium quantity, where supply and demand intersect. Um, so for micro, they tend to focus more on, you know, where's dead weight loss in a market? Where's consumer surplus? Where's producer surplus? So let's see the direction of this question. Um, so A says calculate the total producer surplus at the market equilibrium. Um, when they ask you these types of questions, these math questions on the AP exam, they usually give you these neat little triangles to work with. So you know, like, you know producer surplus is the area under the price and above the supply curve. Good. So half times base times height, that's triangle, right? Not even an economics thing, it's just basic life <laughs> uh, formula right there. Half times base times height for triangles. Um, if the government poses a price floor of $16, make sure you know where price floors are supposed to go. For price floors to be binding, for them to have an effect in the market, uh, price floors have to actually go above equilibrium. So if the price floor is at $16, ask yourself, is that above equilibrium or is it below equilibrium? Because if the price floor at $16, if that's below equilibrium, nothing's going to happen. Right, so... Blah, blah, blah. C says instead the government poses a price ceiling at $12. Um, so price ceiling at $12. Ceilings are supposed to go below equilibrium. So obviously we know there's going to be some sort of misallocation of economic resources in this situation. Um, so here they just want you to explain what that misallocation would look like. Is that a surplus or is it a shortage? You know, that, 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 that's, that's your explanation that a ceiling price of $12, it's a legal maximum price. So the quantity demanded is how uh, is what based on the graph? The quantity supplied is what based on the graph? Um, and then indicate what that shortage or surplus is. This is all found in my Noble One packets and my Noble One book from the Noble Review, of course. So if instead the government restricts C part D, the part D, if instead the government restricts the market output to 10 units, um, calculate the dead weight loss. You know, typically dead weight losses are neat little triangles as well. So 10 units, take that 10 units straight up, and then we have this cool triangle right here. Remember, dead weight loss triangles usually, almost all the time, not every single time, usually are these nifty little arrowheads, these triangles that point to what would be the market equilibrium. So this big triangle here at 10 units of output points directly to that market price of $20 as you see here. Like I said, the key, you get, get the key on your own because I want my students to work this out for themselves. Um, show your work, you're just putting down those numbers, the half times base times height formula, uh, and then just plugging that in with your nifty calculators. It's really not difficult math at all, but you're allowed to use calculators. All right, so now there's a decrease in the price from $20 to $12. So $12 is the new price, $20 is the old price. They say calculate the price elasticity of demand. So make sure uh, when you calculate this question, uh, so price elasticity of demand is the percent change in the quantity demanded divided by the percent change in the price. So for this, you, you ignore, ignore the supply curve. It doesn't exist for the price elasticity of demand. You don't need it. You're just working with the points along the demand curve. So you find, you know, $12. You find $12 along the demand curve. You see what the corresponding quantity demanded is. You find $20, what the corresponding quantity demanded is. So do the percent change in the quantity, which is final minus initial over initial times 100, new minus old over old times 100 uh, for quantity. And then you divide that by the percent change in the price, final minus initial over initial times 100. So we saw on the macro practice set too that uh, the College Board put out. They also had the percent changes that you had to 
use too. So again, that's like a life formula. New minus old over old times 100. Not a special economic formula. So in that price range, so based on your number, the uh, price elasticity of demand, was it greater than one or is it less than one? Um, when we classify elasticity of demand, we usually just take the classification as, a, as an absolute value. So you know you have a negative number because demand is a downward sloping uh, curve. Um, but if it's greater than one, it's elastic. Less than one's inelastic. And obviously unitary elastic uh, would be one. And of course, they're asking about the extremes here. Perfectly elastic, perfectly inelastic. That's only going to happen if you have a horizontal demand curve for perfectly elastic or a vertical demand curve if it's perfectly inelastic. And I don't see a horizontal or vertical demand curve there. All right, moving on. Uh, the second part of that first question is oligopoly chopping broccoli here. Look, we got two airline companies. So uh, when you're working with these duopolies, it's typically going to end up with a game theory matrix like you see here. Um, they tell you everything that you need to know in the background. The cool thing about these College Board APE contests is they usually they, they give you a lot of information in the question. You know, they, they, they tell you here that the relevant payoff matrix appears below with the first entry in each cell would be air touches daily profit. So typically the first number that you see in each cell corresponds to the firm or the player on the left. And then the second number in each cell corresponds to the player that's on the top. So in which market structure do these firms operate? So the second that you see uh, a game theory matrix, you should start thinking oligopoly right away because these, these firms are you know, like interdependent in terms of what, what their profits, their payouts will be. It's going to depend uh, on what other firms decide to do. Uh, before even tackling questions like this, you want to look for just dom obvious dominant strategies. You know, if I'm looking at AirTouch real quick, I'm comparing $1,000 if they go in the morning versus $750 if they win in the evening, so the morning's looking better. And then I compare, you know, $700 here in the, in the morning versus $900 in the evening, so now the evening's looking better, so it kind of depends. Um, for Windward, you do the same thing. You're comparing the 700 here to the 600 here, so morning's looking good. And for Windward, this 950 is more than this 800 if they left in the evening. So if Windward has a clear dominant strategy that it should leave in the morning based on the information that I'm eyeballing here. Um, so you just answer the questions straightforward like that, oligopolies. Um, do, 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 boom. Yeah, pretty simple. I find historically students really like when the game theory questions pop up as free response uh, problems uh, because they usually can pull off most of those points. All right, so again, check your answers against uh, against the key. They said this is uh, this looks like 2007, but that popped up on there. All right, so now the longer question. Longer question, 1995, kicking it old school, peaches and nectarines. Look at that, 1995. Wow. Wow. I was in high school. Cool. All right, not that cool. All right, so here for the long free response question, basic supply and demand. So to kick things off here, uh, peaches and nectarines are substitutes. Substitute goods, so they are related, uh, both are produced under competitive market conditions, competitive long run equilibrium. Uh, the peaches and nectarines, so you know, with agriculture, you're typically working with competitive markets, usually perfectly competitive markets. So Joyce is a producer in the peach industry. So she's one of many producers in the peach industry. She discovers a technological breakthrough that only reduces the cost of producing peaches. So explain how the chain technology affects Quantity, price, and short profits for Joyce. All right, so good. So you have to remember, if you're working with competitive markets, um, one firm really can't change the price. That's usually not really a trick question, but that's usually there's no effect on the price of the product if only one firm um, sees some, some change. 
what will change are their economic profits. So, you know, here Joyce discover has a technological breakthrough, so she's more productive, which means her marginal costs probably are falling, lower average total costs. So, I'd expect to see uh, more output and higher profits, uh, at least in the short run, for Joyce. Um, and then as it goes to larger scale, you consider the effects in the overall market for the next part. It says assume that all peach producing firms adopt the new technology. Um, there's a greater supply uh, uh, in the market, and that would affect the prices of peaches in that market and the quantity of the peaches produced. So see the difference? Uh, they want the one competitive firm with the Joyce situation versus... Um, the entire market here with the technology. That's a, that's a common theme that's popped up many times on the micro free responses in recent years. Like I said, uh, I don't remember if I said it actually in this video or not, but it's always a good idea to do, and I have my students do this every year, do the last five years worth of FRQs. They're all on uh, the College Board's website, AP Central. It's... I don't, know. I don't see why you wouldn't do that. You know, I always require my students to do the last five years. You should do the last ten. You know, see all the different variations that can pop up. It's really not that difficult. Um, boom. All right, it's 95. Last part. New technology is not applicable to the production of nectarines. So now we're in the nectarine market. And explain how the changes that occurred in the peach industry will affect the nectarine industry. All right, so... Um, based on how there's there's fancy technology in the peach market, so peaches are, are cheaper. Uh, the prices of peaches fall, so I would expect there to be less demand for the substitute. Remember, there's kind of like that direct relationship between the price of substitute good A and the demand for substitute good B. So if the price of peaches uh, goes down from that new technology, then there would be less demand for the alternative, which are nectarines in this case. So the price of nectarines would fall. Um, in that case, uh, because there's less demand for nectarines since they are substitute goods, quantity of nectarines would also decrease. So then they bring that to the labor market for the nectarine laborers, the nectarine workers. So supply and demand, it's a... I don't know, do they say competitive? Yeah, obviously competitive. Uh, graph above depicts supply and demand curves for workers in the nectarine industry. Explain how the technological breakthrough in the peach industry affects the labor market for nectarine workers. So here we're pretty much talking about derived demand. If there's less demand for a product, there's most likely less demand for those laborers. Makes sense, right? It's pretty much common sense. So less demand for a product, less demand for the workers, and of course, uh, there'd be a few workers hired in that case, right? So like I said, my students are going, will complete this practice set as well as the last five years, which they have been working on before tackling uh, the micro test on, what was that date again? Was that dirt? Boom. Ah, on May 20th, like we said before. All right, that's it. Hope this was a little bit helpful. I mean, especially for my students, this video was made for my students, but no, I just put it on, uh, put it out there in case other people find it helpful too. That's it.